Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, the head of the State Department of Child Safety talks about the balance between child protection and parental rights. And we'll get an update of the state's bioscience industry. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The U.S. Department of Justice will investigate how the Maricopa County Recorder's Office handled Arizona's presidential preference election last month. The Justice Department Civil Rights Division sent a letter to County Recorder Helen Purcell asking for a variety of information, including a complete list of registered voters at the time of the election. Procedures used in determining the location and number of polling places, including the reasons for the reduction of places to vote. Procedures involved in recording party registration and the county's response to concerns about long lines, along with allegations that the lines may have disproportionately burdened minority voters. Now, the county has until April 22nd to comply, and County Elections Director Karen Osborne says that the response will be made public. And Arizona Secretary of State Michelle Reagan's actions on voting day are raising questions, specifically her offer to take ballots from the governor's office to polling places. Reagan had previously called such actions, referred to as ballot harvesting, as an opportunity for fraud. Ballot harvesting will be a felony later this year by way of a new law signed by the governor. Reagan said she did nothing wrong because the practice now is legal, and she also says once it does become illegal, it will not apply to her because she says election officials are trusted to handle ballots and that the new law exempts election officials engaged in their official duties. The Arizona Department of Child Safety was created to better attack the problem of child abuse, but balancing the needs of an abused or neglected child with the rights of the child's parents, that's still an issue. Joining us now is DCS Director Greg McKay. Good to see you again. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Let's Glad talk about this, this Attorney General's uh, opinion on the state ombudsman's report. The, the ombudsman said basically, no, you can't interview the parents unless it's uh, abuse or abandonment. That is by statute. Mm -hmm. You thought this wasn't a very good, uh, very good reasoning here, and it sounds like the AG agreed. Give us a background on this. Yeah, so uh, years ago, statute from about 1980 uh, allowed DCS or CPS at the time to do interviews whereby they could interview a child when the allegation was abuse or abandonment. Moving forward into the 90s, abandonment wasn't really the word of choice, and it was abuse and neglect. Uh, moving into the future, we have a few statutes that, that delegate our authority. And in those statutes, some statutes say abuse and neglect, some statutes say abuse and abandonment. But bottom line is, is our mandate by statute is to ensure child safety, always protect the child. So when it came down to a, a statutory interpretation or a disagreement, so to speak, between the ombudsman and us at the department, you know, we erred on the side of child protection and child safety, and, and we're just real glad that the attorney generals uh, found in our favor. I know the interpretation again says abuse and abandonment, but uh, you, you're saying that neglect needs to be included here. Right. What, what is define right. neglect? So neglect constitutes about 70 to 80 percent of all of our reports of maltreatment in Arizona, and and I think what the misconception is is that neglect means poverty or parenting choices that might not be up to somebody else's uh, you know, regard in terms of reasonable parenting. But in reality, neglect is a whole variety of really serious issues. A, a, a parent that gives birth to a drug addicted child, that's a neglect case. A, a, a parent who's afflicted with a, a drug addiction, that's an, a neglect case. Uh, sexual abuse cases come in at sometimes as neglect cases. So it's not something that we could not investigate or not be able to interview on because they are very dangerous in certain circumstances. So circumstance. in, in current practices, when can you not interview a child um, without the parent's, uh, you know, uh, authority? Mm -hmm. And are there times where, you know, the parent's authority, when they say no, right. you go away? Well, well right now, statute and now as interpreted by the AG's office says we can do those interviews of children in both abuse and neglect cases without parental consent. And if that child's a victim or a witness to an event, then it's important for an investigator to be able to get an, a, a kind of an unabated story as to what took place so we can find facts, so we can protect the child. At the same time, however, 
um, we, are, we are constantly sensitive to a parent's rights. We know sometimes people use our child abuse hotline to get at their neighbor, mm -hmm. get at their ex, get at a friend who they're upset with. That kind of abuse of the system results in us having to go out and do work that we shouldn't be doing. And on also, uh, it really is an infringement on the rights of a parent who did nothing wrong. So we're always weighing that delicate balance and, and, and we approach things and we, we have to be diligent and we have to have good faith on our exercise of trying to find out fact, what happened uh, while balancing a parent's right to parent in the way they see fit. We should note that uh, the, the Attorney General's opinion did not impact interviews regarding the sibling of a child at the center of the complaint, mm -hmm. living with a child mm -hmm. at the center of the complaint, and a child who is the center or, or contacts your department. Those interviews were okay before the opinion. They are still okay now, correct? Yes, absolutely. And we were faced with a tough choice back right before Christmas. And that choice was, as brought to us by the ombudsman, was stop the process immediately. Do not interview children anymore without a parent parent consenting to that. So we weighed on the side of child safety and child protection and we we pushed forward and, and we're glad that it came out in our favor as you know it would have been some serious liability if, if the alternative was found. There are those who are happy with the Attorney General's opinion. Mm -hmm. They say that this basically gives your department and your employees too much authority. Do they have a point? Mm -hmm. Yeah I, I, I do and uh, to my earlier point the last thing we want to do is encroach on a family uh, maybe interview children separate from them when there's nothing wrong, when they're not abusive, when that child's not vulnerable. It's the last thing we want to do. Um, one of the things we're pursuing here in Arizona to kind of get in front of that is something called family assessment response, or some states call that differential response. And it's a way that if investigations, if reports come to us by way of our hotline and alleges abuse and risk or vulnerability and a child might be in danger, then we have to investigate and take it down the normal traditional path. But in cases where families are maybe challenged with poverty and they can't care for their child, they can't provide a safe home for their child for reasons other than mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, physical abuse or, 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 or uh, intentional abuse, then we approach them more in a, a, a collaborative setting. We reach out, we make an appointment, we call them, we sit down with them, we see what do we need to do to get you strengthened so that you can keep your own child in your own home without any further intervention from Kind of a, a lower level sure. for, for lower level cases. Yes, then. that's something we're working on now and we're hoping that's going to start up probably about uh, beginning of next calendar year, hopefully. hopefully. For, those, for those who think that there should be no contact and led there, unless there's a, the probable cause of a crime occurring, that should be more the level as opposed to a phone call here or innuendo there. Again, they're looking out for the family first and they're worried about government intervention. Mm -hmm. Again, do they have a point? Well, sure, but how do you, you know what, how do you get to probable cause without an investigation? So um, if somebody, and this is the hard thing, People get upset sometimes when our staff goes out and does an investigation. It turns out it was a custody related or a neighbor dispute or something like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to us, we're receiving an allegation. We make a report of an allegation and we have to go out and find that fact. And, and it's, it works on the flip side. We, we have to find probable cause to say that the allegation of, of abuse is not, not here or by probable cause and by fact finding we find that in fact this is something that we can substantiate as abuse and move forward. But without the right to interview, which is the basic first step in every process of investigation, then we, we thwart our, our ability to find out even what happened. Do you see, and I, I can't see how you wouldn't see this, but because we talk about this year after year, the pendulum swinging back mm -hmm. and forth yep. to parental rights, child safety. You'd start emphasizing child safety. You get folks saying you're taking kids out of the home unnecessarily. You start emphasizing parental rights, and we have all sorts of headlines of yes. hideous. Yes. How do you balance that? Where do yes. you find the middle? It needs to be in the middle. And uh, you find the middle by, uh, by just good faith exercises, using tools, finding facts, the most objective set of principles that you can find to help our workforce make those decisions. The bottom line is, is it is very double-edged. If our workforce, they go to places that the average Arizona citizen sitting at home watching right now wouldn't dream of walking into these homes without a gun or an army, so to speak. But our caseworkers are doing that and then they're faced with a really dire situation and a decision that needs to be made. If they leave a child behind, then it's like fingers crossed, how can we get help there to, to you know, mitigate the problem now? 
um, or they remove a child knowing that that's going to inflict trauma on that child and trauma on that family. So they walk that line. It's a delicate balance, but we do need to find a middle. We need to act on facts and principles and not emotions and fear and whatever way the wind's blowing right now. We got to we got to we got to stabilize that. I got I can't let you go without asking about the backlog of cases. Yeah. How is that going? Yeah. Is, are you making progress? Oh yeah, excellent. So I'm glad you did. Thank you. Uh, so I think last time we talked when I started last year, backlog was at 16,200 and climbing. It never stopped climbing for the prior five years. Today, the backlog is about 10,500. And more importantly, um, every single month this workforce is completing more than's coming in. So before, a, you know, if 5,000 reports came into our organization, they only completed 3,000. And that happened month over month over month, year after year. It's like credit card debt interest, compound interest. Now the backlog's down to about 10,500. But more importantly, those cases are being triaged for safety. We're not just, you know, we're not just playing with numbers. I was going to say, how are you making sure right. that the backlog has been cut, but right. the work's right. still being done? So bottom line is these are, these are being completed, not just activated, so to speak. So this isn't about someone going in and typing a sentence and now it's off the radar. This is being done, completed. And, and what we did when we came in is we found that there were 16,200 backlog cases, which nobody knew what child was really in danger, how high the risk was. And again, these are cases that got started, completed up to a certain point, and then never closed. Um, so we ended up making a triage that says, what children were born with, with drug exposure? What children are under five years of age? What children have homes with domestic violence in them? How many priors they might have had? So now we part out those risk factors and then we send our people out to work those highest risk ones first. So they're doing great work. I mean, about 200% increase in productivity year over year by the great work that they're doing. So we're, we're, we're thrilled about it, but lots more to, lots more to be done. Indeed, obviously. and last time we talked, uh, morale was a problem, mm -hmm. and I asked you about that, yeah. and it, it, it seemed like it was a real problem. Yeah. Is it improved? You know, I'd like to say morale has improved, but our, our, our volume is obviously still high. We still have 135,000 calls came to us last year. Of those, 51,000 became full investigations. That's a massive workload. Plus, we're carrying along now still 10, 10 and a half thousand old reports. So, you know, when we get to the point where somebody can come to work and do the work without being completely overwhelmed and really engage people in the way that they were trained and that the way they wanted to do as social workers, then morale will improve. And, and you know, I think I'm seeing a lot of increases in morale. But bottom line is that caseload needs to get under control. And we're seeing that that's starting to happen. So we're, we're really thrilled about that. All right. It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining yeah, thank us. Thank you, Ted. I appreciate the time. In northwest Arizona, just off State Route 95, stands a peculiar monument to the town of Oatman. Oddly, the marker is 15 miles from the town it honors. Wedged into the Black Mountains, the mining town of Oatman was established at the turn of the century. By the 1930s, nearly two million ounces of gold had been extracted from the surrounding mines. The price of gold and World War II forced the closure of the mines in the 40s. The town was delivered another blow when in 1952, a stretch of Interstate 40 opened, siphoning off Oatman's lifeblood, Route 66 traffic. It quickly became a ghost town.
Route 66 is again its lifeblood. Nostalgia for the Mother Road and the Old West draw tourists from all over the world. They walk the boardwalks, hang with the local gunfighters, and are followed around by Oatman's most famous residents, the Burroughs, descendants of those set free by miners years ago. Being closer to Nevada than the town itself, Oatman's misplaced monument is long forgotten, but the town is remembered daily. The Flynn Foundation's commissioned a report to analyze the performance of Arizona's bioscience industry as part of a strategy to guide the state's bioscience industry for the next 10 years. Here with more on the report is Brad Halverson, Flynn Foundation Executive Vice President, and Mark Slater, Vice Chair of Arizona's Bioscience Roadmap Steering Committee. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tim. Uh, the Bioscience Roadmap, uh, just in general, what are we talking about? Uh, the Bioscience Roadmap is in its 14th year. It's a statewide strategic plan to advance the biosciences in Arizona. It's currently the, the longest uh, serving st uh, strategic plan for a state in the biosciences in the nation. It's a living and breathing plan, changes, evolves, and has a lot of input from bioscience leaders throughout the state. If it's living and breathing, how's it doing? You know, it's just been amazing. Uh, the past decade or so has shown em enormous growth in science as well as opportunities for patients. So that's the angle that I tend to think about this is Arizonans now are able to get advanced care here in their own community that wasn't available before and we're bringing in new jobs and new science that was not available before this. Uh, as far as the state of bioscience in general in Arizona, what are you seeing? Yeah. Well, we're seeing uh, a, a, an industry that's thriving. We're seeing collaboration among, uh, among the various players from universities to uh, research institutes to the hospital segment and to uh, private industry. We're seeing uh, uh, care for patients that is also bringing patients from outside of the region. Just at Honor Health, for example, we've had patients from 49 states and two dozen countries that have come here for clinical trials that are not available elsewhere. And so Arizona has become a destination site for this type of innovation. Is that destination site transferring to more jobs? It is. We just had a report released last week, an update on the metrics, how we're doing in Arizona's bioscience sector. Uh, on the job side, uh, the growth continues on a positive trajectory. Bioscience jobs are growing here almost four times as fast as the rest of the nation. Uh, they're high paying jobs, about 62,000 per job. Uh, that's about a third higher than the private sector average would be. As far as uh, risk capital investment, how's that doing? Risk capital has always been a challenge for Arizona, uh, but that's been coming along the last three or four years. It's improved dramatically. We have a ways to go, but the environment is getting a lot better for early stage companies to find risk capital and help get off the ground. And I know you kind of referred to a university, a, a, a tech transfers and these sorts of things. Again, give us an update. We're seeing improvements in tech transfer and we're seeing a, a, a very competitive market for a federal grant funding and that remains a challenge for getting that early stage research that can be the basis for developing new tech and new transfer. I think I saw in your report 24% increase in bio-related university startups. That's not too shabby. Yes. Yeah, there was, uh, in the last two years, there have been 21 bioscience startups uh, that have been spun off from Arizona's universities. And that's picking up quite a bit from previous years, which weren't too bad either. So that's uh, 21 new firms in the biosciences getting off the ground here in Arizona. Okay, well, it's not all uh, butterflies and daffodils here because uh, we're hearing a lot of positive, but there is some concern, and the concern is over research funding. We're not seeing yeah. as much as we should. What's going on out there? Well, in the first decade of the Bioscience Roadmap, Arizona made a concerted effort to really keep up with the rest of the nation and even exceed it uh, in terms of getting grants from the National Institutes of Health uh, and did so. Uh, we've seen over the last couple of years, though, that relative to the rest of the nation, the pace is slowing. It's a challenging environment uh, in regards to that the budget is less for NIH grants, a lot of competition for these grants. So we've seen a, uh, a slight downturn in Arizona's performance. So we'll, uh, we'll be looking at that with statewide bioscience leaders. I was going to say, how does Arizona compete better on that level? Uh, how do we compete better on that yeah. level? Uh, collaboration has always been one of our 
uh, one of our assets that we've had, I think, uh, the universities, uh, research hospitals, others that are in this sphere to, uh, to get together and, and figure out ways that we can uh, regain the success that we had from the first decade. It sounds like academic R&D expenditures as well, not where they should be. Talk to us about this. I think there's an opportunity there for us to regain ground. It's, uh, uh, other regions are competing. They're putting a lot of dollars in, in play. Uh, it's been a challenge, I think, for Arizona to keep up in that regard. Uh, we've made up for that through collaboration among institutions and leveraging the advantages of multiple uh, parties uh, to be able to make advantage rather than one all alone. Indeed, it's, it's got to be tough to grow without yeah. research money. It just has to be very difficult. And if that research money has fallen off, why? And if, if it's a more competitive environment, again, the same question uh, to ask Brad, it, why are we not more competitive? What's going on out there? You know, it's difficult to sustain these efforts. I think Arizona has been a leader in investing in these opportunities in the past, and much of the success that we see today has been because of those investments that have come in, in, in past. As we're looking forward, the, the key challenge will be to sustain those investments and to move forward from the uh, public sector as well as from the private sector. Was there a bit of a, uh, it's new, it's shiny, it's exciting, let's, let's get on board when things started off and now it's, uh, it's hitting those, those teenage years? Yeah, I think there's some growing pains. Uh, I, I think that the first decade of the roadmap was really focused on building the research infrastructure and, and a good job was done of that and that has paid off in these, in these promising industry numbers that we've seen. Uh, but yeah, more attention to the, to the research side of things is necessary to keep that industry growth continuing in the future. Is that the major goal now for the next decade, research it's, money? It's, well, it's that plus especially uh, private risk capital to help get young firms off the ground and through the valley of death, as they call it. Uh, those two would probably be our two priorities that we have on mind today. How about turning research into products, into treatment? I mean, yeah. uh, that's got to be a goal. That's really, I think, what it's all about. This is, there's no value in just research for research's sake. It's what can come out of that to have an impact. Uh, we look at having an impact right here and right now in our own community and how we can turn these findings and translate findings from the sciences into products that make a real difference in patients' lives so that they live better quality of life and longer lives. Uh, we have an opportunity to do that here in Arizona. There is uh, the talent to do that. There is a collaboration to do that. And the world is much more connected, so we can do that within our community as well as bringing people from outside the community together. That's a really good point. You mentioned competition. You mentioned the connectivity of the yes. world. You put those two together, that can be, uh, make it a little more tougher, but it could also help, couldn't it? I mean, it could grease the skids a little bit, couldn't it? As far as connectivity with other regions? Well, just as far as getting, getting Arizona a bit better up to speed. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of our one of the goals of the of the biosciences roadmap right now is is connectivity with other regions as far as establishing other other outposts where we're doing our business. Um, I'm get, getting back on where Arizona stands relative to other regions, uh, we're not one of the hot spots yet in the country, but we're one of the fastest growing. Um, the industry is a significant industry. If uh, uh, $14 billion annual economic impact, uh, and that's without including the hospitals in that figure. So we're not really one of the big players yet nationally, but it's still a substantial industry here in Arizona. You, you know, and to add to that, we are already international players. So there are collaborations now that are going on with Asia, uh, with uh, the, the Americas through Europe, that are uh, happening right here and are, are connected. So uh, uh, although there's, there's still room to go to be one of the big players, we have had an impact. And it has also brought talent and brought technology from other regions of the country here. That was a motivator for me coming nine years ago from San Diego area because of the collaboration and the opportunities that we see here in Arizona. With that, big question, major question, mm -hmm. how best to turn Arizona into a bioscience powerhouse? Yeah, that's really, it's a multi-pronged effort. I think we all need to get behind recognizing the importance of that for our community, for our culture, for our business opportunities, and for the quality of life that we all want to see. That will take investment, that takes collaboration among the talent, and it really takes a will to make that happen. Same question Well said, to you. well said. It takes a coordinated effort uh, among and between the public and private sectors, just as Mark pointed out. 
uh, that's the key to work together and, and pool our, our strengths and our resources to leapfrog over other areas of the country that are, have been at this longer than we have. Are, are the, is everyone ready to pool resources? Is, is, it, is it working? We've had a good track record of that. We have, a, an, in fact, a national reputation for that, that we hear when we are outside of Arizona, that you guys are the guys that collaborate. So we need to, <laughs> we need to find, we need to get, continue that collaborative gene and grow that collaborative gene, as it's called. An example of that has been the Stand Up to Cancer Awards for Dream Teams for uh, Major Innovation in Cancer. Three of those awards, the only community to be able to achieve that, which brings in not only local institutions like TGen and Honor Health, but also national institutions, Johns Hopkins, Penn, Columbia, Salk Institute, et cetera. That's the way I think we can advance in this community. All right, very good. Gentlemen, good to have you here. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. We Thank appreciate you, it. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.